Okay. What's up, guys? My name's Cody Deal, and you're listening to the Chain Clinkers Podcast. You're listening to the Chain Clankers Podcast with your hosts, Quinn Ferris and Horatio Gonzalez. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chain Clankers. Good morning, everyone, or after, you know, whenever you are listening, we appreciate you here being with us. We have a great episode for you today. We got to talk with Cody Deal, but, you know, my partner here in crime will tell you more about the episode. Yeah, what's going on, guys? Thank you for checking out the Chain Clinkers Disc Golf Podcast. We've got local Wichita pro Cody Deal. Um, and fantastic episode here, guys. And, you know, you're going to learn how he went from a new player in May of 2020 to competing in the pro division just a single year later. That's kind of the overarching theme of this episode is how can you put yourself in a position to go from a new player, a beginner to someone who's competing in the pro division. There are so many tips in this episode. We're going to talk to you about being vulnerable and how you can push yourself in order to get better. And I think that's very, very important. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a like rating. If you're listening on YouTube, YouTube. If you're not listening on YouTube, maybe it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iHeartRadio, wherever you're listening to us from. Maybe let us know where you're listening to us from and leave a rating and review if you can and let us know your thoughts on this episode or maybe a tip that you're going to go for moving forward. We'd really appreciate that. But without further ado, let's go ahead and let's bring Cody on. Cody, welcome on to the Chain Clankers podcast, man. How are we doing today? I'm great, brother. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, welcome in. You know, so for people that don't know, you are a local here, uh, a Wichita player for us. Luckily, you know, being here out of Wichita, we have a lot of awesome talent. And for some, I don't know why that is. Why do you think that is? Like, I feel like we have a c- good scene here. May, I, I've, you know, like I said, I've been in it a very short time. But from what I understand is we have a lot of courses per capita per person. So I think just having an overwhelming amount of disc golf courses is a really good indicator of why it's so popular around the area. Yeah, for sure. This town has definitely started to blow up. Uh, names coming out of here, you know, Logan Harpool, Nolan Ramser, I'm pretty sure took top 20 at DDO. Um, and the kid's still like 16 or 17. So he's going to be a real threat here in a couple of years. Oh, yeah. Um, Already yourself, is. Yeah, Smitty, a bunch of other guys. Um, super, super just growing area. It's so nice to be somewhere where like there are a ton of disc golf courses per capita. You can literally go play dis- different disc golf course every day of the week if you wanted to. Uh, maybe that could be a fun challenge that we do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's yeah, and it's also helps that like Wichita is one of those cities, you know, it's kind of middle of nowhere. Like, you know, for people that want stuff to do, like there's not a whole lot. You can find stuff to do, you know. If you want to be boring, you're gonna get bored, but if you find stuff to do it's a great place. It's big enough that it has, you know, those amenities, but there's not a whole lot to do. So if you're into disc golf, it's great because there's a ton of courses. Oh yeah. Cause I I know we take it for granted because some people, I think even if you go down to Oklahoma city, there's just a limited amount in that area. And there's like, you know, a lot, you know, millions of people in that area. There's a few courses in Norman, but I think we're pretty spoiled here. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Cody, how did you first get into disc golf? You said that you've only been in it for a short amount of time. How long have you been playing and why did you get into it? Um, I've been playing since I think approximately last May. So just a little over a year. And um, my older brother, Lucas, he's been in it for like seven years. And my twin brother had been playing it for a long time, but he has four little girls now. So he has a very limited supply of free time. Um, but he's always been around it. My sister-in-law is a, is a local pro and she's been, you know, a really great player, um, in the FPO and they, they just love it. They go and do tournaments out of town on the weekends and always sounded really fun, but I was always into like other sports and fitness and stuff. And then, you know, Corona happened and all the gyms closed down and I was like, I, I, I need to move my body. I, I, I feel alive when I move and when I can or, you know, so I was like, maybe this will be fun. So I started doing that kind of just here and there, you know, um, playing a lot more. And then last April, um, um, our mom passed away. And so uh, I just, my mind was going a little rampant on that. And so I was like, man, I need to be disciplined and devote myself seriously to, 
something. It doesn't matter what it is. I just need to devote and obsess over it. So that's kind of what happened. And then from that, um, I used to like not really enjoy it that much. I was super athletic and I was not athletic at this. I looked like just, it's really hard to be like in an athletic build, but like look really, really horrible. And so that was always kind of a big challenge. And, uh, but that's kind of how I found it. And then I just have been uh, a devotee or an obsessor of the sport ever since. Did that challenge, you know, feeling unathletic or like feeling like you weren't good at something, um, kind of add to that obsession of wanting to be good at it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know. Like, um, I'm not really the, like, disc golf kind of fits my lane because I've been really unorthodox and, like, just, like, wanted to tackle really weird um, things. So, like, um, you know, I went to college uh, 10 years after I played football and basketball in college and wanted to be a quarterback. And um, I was mostly, uh, like, a tight end or whatever. And I spent two years, like, working with a private guy. And then I got on a Southern – California football team as a quarterback and uh it was a lot of fun you know and I just for many many years the, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I I know how bad it is to be horrible at something in the beginning and you just have to have this unwielding non-judgmental attitude towards yourself when you're starting anything new because there is a what I call a sucking process and you have to get really 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 good at sucking like really good at sucking because there's just a huge learning curve in any endeavor. And so anyway, it definitely, um, the challenge was good, but also just like anyone, you, it's really hard um, when you're not good at something to just want to keep doing it. So there's a fine line between like needing to get through that process and never trying. And I think most people will never try because they try it once, they try it twice. And we have this kind of uh, social view that talent or, skill is is um something that's innate and i believe it's fully acquired and it just takes a lot of discipline and devotion to it that's really interesting so like i guess in the sucking process for yourself was there was there a moment where you were like you know what this is not it chief there is no <laughs> point in continuing i am not going to be good at disc golf let's go find something else to do brother that was that was most of the the, the, the time i've been playing uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, and that's the thing is I think, I think, you know, there becomes a point, a breaking point where you're like, yeah, this is going to take about 15 years to get pretty good at. And then, um, just, uh, through the, the circumstances of having the gyms closed and needing to devote myself, I just, you know, I put everything aside and just, you know, I got out there and I played 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 and I didn't care how bad I was. I just loved getting out there. There's something I think you guys are familiar with the sport is, there's a calmness, there's a serenity when you get out there. There's something that um, is, it's like, it's your breakaway from society, for me anyway. And um, it was just the perfect like place to just break away. Um, and so all the elements combined to, to me not, like not judging myself um, and not thinking long-term. I think too many people think like, yeah, I, I always thought, oh, well maybe I can be a pro disc golfer. Or maybe I could tour. And then, uh, you know, I can't even, you know, throw 200 feet, you know? But having that dream is what kind of like fueled me even through like the, the very beginning process when we're all just like really novice beginners, you know? So I guess with having that in mind, you know, of like potentially going pro, what would you say would be the differences between you and like another average player who started about the same time, who was wanting just to play and get better? What would be that like that mindset difference? And like also I feel like it would apply to how you played and practiced. Um, I, I don't think there's any difference between me or any other person. Um, we all have our, uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, I just feel like, um, from, you know, what was going on that I needed to get out there. It, wa it wasn't a choice at the time. And so I just think that it's the time that you put into it. And it that sounds really simple, right? But it's really the time that you put into it. If you want to get better at anything, again, there's, there's a way to, you know, consciously practice. And then there's a way to just get out there and not really get better, of course. But really, even if you're getting out, you're going to get incrementally better every single time. There's a way to really pay attention and get even more, more better, right? Um, is that right English? I don't know. But, um, you know, I think, um, 
I think the way I have learned a lot of how to, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm a, I know that the more I put time into something, you know, like when I did the college football thing, I didn't have, like disc golf, you can go out there and throw and get better. You don't need another person. It's really hard to, for me to throw to someone every day and catch passes. And so, you know, I go out there with one football and just throw into a net, just working on mechanics. And like, I did that for dozens of hours. I mean, it was so boring, but like, you know, so like that's the discipline I think. And, and again, I hope people know that I am terrible. I'm a terrible disc golfer. <laughs> I'm not the greatest. Um, there's so much I need to learn. Obviously I'm way better than I was a year ago. I played with a guy the other day. He goes, you're like a thousand times better since, since you first began, since I first played with you. And me, this is really funny because I don't feel that way because I still struggle with all this stuff that I know I need to get better at. You know, instead of comparing myself to my brother, who used to be like a god to me, I'm now comparing myself to the elite pros. And so I'm still like way down here. So perception is a big thing. So you don't want to demotivate yourself, but you also have to wake up and realize how far you've come too. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I think that's a really good way of putting it because you always want to push yourself. You always want to be better and have some sort of a thought in the back of your head, kicking yourself like, come on, man, you can get better. You can do this. You can do that. You get out there, go work, go do some practice. Um, but yeah, you, you don't want to demotivate yourself to where it's also, I think a great example of this actually comes from Paul Macbeth. Uh, I want to say it might've been idle wild of 2020, something like that, where he had to hit a putt. I've told this story on the podcast before, but if you're a new listener, I'm going to, I'm going to tell it again. Cause I, this, this always is in the back of my head. He, he had to hit the putt to just stay alive misses the putt and instead of being like no you idiot you dummy why did you miss that it's constructive criticism it's like hey you have to understand with a tailwind you have to aim this way and i just thought that was so cool because there are there's a total difference between two disc golfers one who uses constructive criticism on themselves film themselves work to get better understand and accept what they're bad at in order to get better and then there's the ones who just call themselves bad names and don't do anything constructive or anything like that. Would you agree with that? Like, have you seen any of that in yourself? Ooh, yeah. I think uh, the mental side of disc golf, you certain, you know, all these guys have, you know, a measurable talent, but a lot of them, you know, shoot themselves in their own foot, you know? Um, and I'm not some Zen master and have some clean headspace every single time. You know, I get completely upset at certain shots, but I feel like, I don't know. I'd love to see a statistic where like um, even at the, the, the elite level of like when someone gets a bogey, how often are they going birdie to bogey and how often are they going bogey to bogey? Because I feel like they ride that bogey train, even the best, because um, it's really hard to clean your slate, your mental slate. And that takes a lot of discipline. I'm not good at it, but um, um, you know, through Instagram DMs and, and other people locally, you know, I've, we, we, I've talked to a lot of people about performance um, and like mindset and stuff like that. And my thing is, is, uh, you know, I'm just like my golf game. This part of my game is, 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 is not perfect either, but um, I feel like you, you know, the, my, my major um, thing out there is just to feel good, to be light and that there's okay, it's okay to get angry and blow up for an instant. But when you, you but anger is a, is, a, is a slippery slope, you know? So when you can't nip it in the bud right there, it's easy to just use that fuel of anger to, to, to not allow you to perform well. Because I know when I'm angry, there's, I'm not loose, I'm not relaxed, I'm making more mistakes, my mind is more abrupt. And so my decision making goes in and um, is not good either. So um, uh, when I played Emporia Country Club for DDO, um, I shot like close to my first thousand rated round, which is, you know, for me, pretty decent. And um, I took a I took a snowman on a hole and still shot a thousand rated round, which is really good for me. But it was only like a really big mistake that I had. And I was able to just let it go you know, instead of taking bogey after bogey. And I'm not always like that. Usually for me, I'm on a bogey train for one or two holes. And I'm really trying to get that out of my headspace, you know. And so I, I don't know the tools, but um, I'm always – I think that's the biggest part of the game at the elite level is, is the mental game. That was a really long answer. I am so sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's great. You know, going back into that, you know, I would say 
some of the better rounds that I have played myself are the ones where I'm relaxed. I'm playing for fun, for fun. I'm not too worried about it. And then some of the worst are when I'm like trying to beat a PR or like, I'm trying to like score the best I have. But then I feel like there's also a balance, you know, where if you're too relaxed and you're too for fun and you're trying to score good, you're like, Oh, well, I got a par. That's fine. And you're not like as hard on yourself. Then it's a little tougher to, uh, be competitive and get those birdies, you know, that you could be getting. But then there's also the other end. If you're being too hard on yourself and you're too worried about the score, then you're messing up. So how do you find that balance, that middle line where you're having fun, you're relaxed, but you're still saying, come on, we got to go. We got to get this bird. For me personally, um, it's a really good question. Um, is I think that I play the best, like you said, when I'm lighthearted, loose, and that – I'm calibrating to those feelings. And I, I feel like when you talk about calibrating to emotions, it's a little weird, but like, that's what we do as humans. Sometimes we don't realize we have conscious control of that, but I know that if I'm calibrating to feeling good and talking to myself, the stories that I'm telling myself, if I hit a tree, I can go into the sob story. God, I've only been playing for a year. I can't do up shots. Why do I suck so bad at up shots? It should be so much better. And all that's going through, that, that's not fuel to, to, to take that next shot. The other one is like, dude, you are, you've, you've come so far in a year. You, 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 you have a natural ability to sense things in sports because you've been playing your whole life. You, you, you know how to shoot this shot. Just be loose. That's a different story. And, and it sounds simple, but really, these are the things that are fueling us. These are, these are our tendencies to go towards the stories that we tell ourselves. So um, my thing is, is, is nipping it in the bud when I do something uh, that is an error that I think I should be better than I am. Um, and a lot of times, sometimes I, I, I take a, a, a middle approach, which is not a good approach, where I'll, I'll, I'll do a shot and then it won't work out. And I, I want to feel good. And, and so I'll say, well, you know, you're just not that good yet. You know, these guys are better than you. So, you know, just, it's okay. You know, and, and I don't think that's really a good, a good thought to put in me because then it, it allows me to just be average. Yeah. So me, I have to think grand. And that's just the way that fuels me is I have to know that I'm in, every time I throw a good shot, literally it feels like I'm not doing it. It's the weirdest thing. I'm not doing it. I'm watching it. All I have to do is like, visualize and just let go that's my job and usually when i'm in that kind of state i call it like a like a zen state do you can't really do any wrong and, and it's like it's also you're giving up responsibility to like have to perform well you're just almost like giving it up you have this blind weird trust and that's how i've always been good at basketball like i don't think about oh i gotta put this much arc on it or jump this hard like i do in golf you know i just do it and i just feel good when i'm doing it and that's what I'm trying to get my golf game to, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there almost like a, I guess, like during the shot, you'll hear some people be like, all right, I'm thinking about this or I'm thinking about that. Is it just almost letting all of that go and just yeah. doing? Yeah. Yes and no for me. So so because I'm so new, there's, there's usually, you know, for me, I think that um, – we pride again in society, we apply multitasking as like this grand thing. And I think that it ruins us that hyper focus on one thing is what m produces really good results. So um, when I golf, because I'm so new, there's some things that I have to think about. So there's usually just one single mechanical thing that I need to remind myself of that I'm focused on. And then most of my energy is focused on being loose and visualizing my shot and knowing I'm great enough to hit it. Um, and so like on the back end, it's been the hardest thing for me to learn um, is the biggest thing for me now is getting, um, I thought I was getting more shoulder rotation and I'm more like, you know, this, and now I'm being able to turn my shoulder because I thought I was just reaching back. And now I'm realizing it's actually just a huge shoulder rotation, you know, cur you know, curling. And so, you know, so much power from that, but I have to remind myself of that constantly because that's not how I normally throw. So if I'm going max distance, that's really what I'm concentrated on. If I'm doing like a forehand, there's, it's really angle control, not even power for me at this point, you know, so little reminders like that, or like, um, 
height, just something small that I can remind myself, but letting it all go. Kind of just like in the putt. Usually I, if I miss, I miss low. So me, it's making sure I get the right height. And I'm only really concerned about the height, all the other mechanical stuff. I've, con I've subconsciously let go because I don't have to think about that as much. And it's just about when I putt for sure, dude, the, I, I'm on fire when I am in that state of just letting it all go and just knowing I can make the putt and not thinking about anything mechanically minus this one small little hyper focus on something. That's, you know, that, there's a lot there. I love that answer. Let's go back to a little bit to that backhand, what you said, you know, about the rotation. And this is kind of, you know, just a personal, but it hopefully helps other people. Um, on your backhand, you know, when you are pulling through, I don't know if this is an issue other players had, but do you ever hit your shoulder? Like you feel the disc like come across your arm or like you're tapping it or you hit it. Has that ever happened to you? And like, how do you... You're talking about your non-throwing shoulder? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've never hit it. Um, in the beginning, sometimes I'd hit my chest or something like that just because, you know, I was all over the place. I was just trying to throw it really hard and dumb. But... Um, but I, I, I've never, I've never done that because I think, uh, for me, no, it's just not, it hasn't been a part of like my experience. There's other things that I, I used to do. Like my, the biggest thing in my backhand personally, um, is, is getting my weight too far forward, um, and losing a lot of power. And so by getting that additional shoulder rotation, it actually sets my weight even farther back and it times up the throw even better. You said I'd want to just get over the top so so quick, and so um, so that's been for me. I think that's kind of the next evolution in my throw is 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 I'm finally getting some really good timing by keeping the weight loaded back, kind of like a baseball player when they bat, they almost come up on their you can't see me, but they almost come up on their front foot and lift it up in the air, similar to like when and then that weight comes to the hit when they come through and it all comes forward on the brace, and so that 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 back leg load is something that's really helping me throw a lot better. And if you don't mind, I'm going to stay here real quick, just talking a little bit about backhands. Um, I think that's a fantastic example. I've heard the baseball example as well. I guess the question I have to follow up on that is, have you ever experienced, you know, trying to really keep that weight back? Does that ever kind of like, throw off your angle or maybe kind of throw off your shoulder position um, to maybe almost tip it. Like, cause like, if you think about it, like a baseball player, you know, if they go up with that high leg kick, I could see <laughs> how that could potentially, you know, throw off your upper body. Have you had any issues with that? Is there, is that even something you've thought about before? Like, is there any yeah. kind of fix or something that you're doing with your upper body to make sure your weight stays back and you're staying on that like level line? Mm -hmm. Well, full, full disclaimer, I mess up all the time, uh, you know, still so new at this and still going through a huge discovery process. As much as I've learned in a year, there's just so many things that I, um, that I just don't understand, uh, um, that I'm not consciously aware of yet. Um, and so I'm having a difficult time understanding how to keep your feet lined up forward towards the target with this massive shoulder rotation and hitting your line. Um, but I'm learning and, and, and one thing that has helped me, and this is just recent and, and again, I, I feel like a novice in a lot of ways still, but, um, you know, when I reached back, I would usually have my head still like right here and, you know, Eagle kind of tilts his head back like this. And that, for some reason, when I have that huge shoulder rotation and I bring my, almost my jaw in alignment with that, it just makes me feel like I can hit my line better because if I'm like this, I feel like my timing's off. Um, and so I, it's all, you know, it's an evolution process. Like when I, like I actually do some community clinics here in the Wichita area and I used to never call them clinics because like, you know, I teach the ABCs, not the XYZs. I, I teach very fundamental things about golf that, you know, I usually take one person, I see what I, I watch their form, we isolate one little thing. And I, um, for that individual person, and, um, you know, maybe it's a back foot load, maybe it's shoulder rotation, maybe it's just throwing smooth and not like killing the disc, stuff like that. Um, but I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm an expert in form, because I, I, I am not just like you guys, I've watched a lot of YouTube, and, and I have a general idea of what you should be doing. And I think that's kind of the biggest problem with most people is they have these 
general theories of how to throw and then they get out there and it's not really what a throw is. And so you have to kind of like, just let people experiment with like letting go of like the theory of how you should throw and finding it within your own self. Once you find it within your own self, it doesn't really feel like you're doing all that stuff, if that makes sense. I'm really glad you said that. And we'll get into the clinics a little bit more here in a bit, but just the whole like finding it yourself, you know, because I don't know about you, but I watch a lot of tape of pros. Like I literally have an album on my phone of like all the top pros and um, a lot of people (laughs) and how they throw and trying to pick out what specifically they're doing, what they're doing the same. But one thing I've learned, and I think a lot of people don't realize is that this golf is different in the sense that like you have to get your technique in form, but everybody's body is different. So I can't, if I wa- wanted to watch Eagle McMahon, I can't like consistently watch Eagle and try to imitate him. He's like six two, six three, maybe. I'm five six, you know? I'm a lot shorter, and he's able to throw differently because of his arm span, his height. So if I try to imitate him, it's not going to work for me because we have different bodies. So people that I've tried to, you know, kind of learn from is Emerson Keith and Kevin Jones. If you watch yeah. Kevin Jones, he's stocky, he's shorter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. His favorite shot is a hyzer flip. And mm-hmm. I think there's a reason he does that because he's shorter. He doesn't have those long arms that like Eagle has. So he mm-hmm. has to find that extra power, that distance from those hyzer flips. And yeah. I think a lot of people make that mistake, wouldn't you say? 100%. Um, that's something in the beginning that, you know, you just pay attention to all the pros and, and uh, you're not really thinking about body type. Um, um, or anything like that. But like you said, Emerson Keith, even a guy uh, that is making a huge impact on the tour scene right now, Mason Ford, um, like uh, Emerson's twin almost. <laughs> they have just a very similar look and in, in, uh, in build. Uh, one of the most talented, for, for personally, I think the most talent, one of the, maybe the most talented guy out there. And he's not the tallest guy. He's not the biggest guy. And he's just so smooth. It's just ridiculous how good looking that guy's throw is, you know. So that's the cool thing about disc golf. Um, unlike, you know, basketball or football at the at the elite level, is that you you don't you don't have to have, you know, you don't have to be built like Eagle McMahon. But someone like Eagle is my height. He might be a little less um muscular, but he's still that same body type. Um, long limbs, um, you know, tall. And so someone like that, I can try to emulate more, you know? And, um, and so I think, I think you should definitely pay attention to, to, to the, the players that look like your build, because I, I think you're right. But if you don't mind, if I segue to like, you know, Anheuser flips with Kevin Jones and, um, and like shot types is I think like for sure, because I'm so new, I, I, I want to be able to talk to beginners that like, if you're like getting into the game that you should learn, you know, all shot types. Um, and especially because like a lot of people will get really good and they never develop like say a forehand. Right. Yeah. And so when they do a forehand, they're like, Oh, I just, I suck. I can't do this. You know, I'm not good at it. Well, dude, you used to be like that in your backhand. You don't remember how bad you were. But believe me, you were worse than you are on your forehand right now. So if in the beginning, or if you're still in that process of like, you don't have a forehand, you have to now become a beginner again and go through that grueling process of sucking and sucking and sucking. And most people don't want to suck. You know, they're like, hey, I'd rather work on just like being good and shooting good. But I'm very fortunate that I took the initiative to learn both in the beginning, because sometimes I fill my forehand within 330 feet is more accurate than my backhand. And so a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll choose to forehand um, because I just feel like I have a bit more control on it. I thought that was really, really interesting. And I'm glad you segued there because I, I have a fantastic question. So, you know, you said that, you know, some people will not want to go through that sucking process again. So they just won't even bother to learn a forehander. You know, maybe it's a Heiser flip or a just 
Spike Heiser, or maybe it's an Anheuser putt or a step putt or yeah. whatever it is, literally yeah. anything in their game. And my girlfriend and I both subconsciously over the last couple of weeks have really been working on our forehands more. Um, and both of them have seen tremendous improvement. And it's one of those things where I think the difference between your average disc golfer or someone who, you know, stays where they're at and someone like yourself who moves up divisions throws further, makes more putts consistently, gets into the MPO division, does whatever they want, is being vulnerable and understanding that you have to suck again because if you don't suck, you can never get better. I literally remember telling Horatio something along this line when we started this podcast where if we cannot look back in a year and be like, wow, we sucked then, (laughs) then we never got better. Amen, dude. Yeah. 100%. A lot of people have a bubble of comfort. A lot of people. And uh, my brother Lucas knows this about himself. And so uh, I can talk about it without talking trash on my brother. (laughs) But um, he, you know, for the longest time didn't have a forehand and still to to a most part doesn't outside of, you know, a utility shot of 200 feet and in. But um, since I started playing the game and he's, you know, seeing me improved drastically and dramatically in, in so many levels. Um, he finally just started to attempt, just attempt. That's all I said, dude, just attempt, just try. It's, you're not going to be good. You, it doesn't matter. You're just getting the rep in. You're just getting the rep in. Let's just do one uh, on all of our rounds. Let's just do one uh, as an extra shot on each hole. That's it. Just off the tee. And, you know, so he's getting, you know, 20 extra reps in a day on his forehand. And eventually now he's got a pretty controllable forehand within 200, 250 feet, which for him is like, it's like a miracle, (laughs) you know? So just real quick, you know, let's go into forehand a little bit. What would you say are those main things for someone? (laughs) They've been playing for a year or so, and they kind of left that, that forehand on the side burner and now they want to pick it up and start practicing, start learning. What are those couple, you know, a few things, you would tell them to focus on to really get the the foundation of that forehand going? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I just think just like in the beginning of a backhand is just getting out there and experimenting um, and experimenting. Uh, I, you know, I have a really unique grip. Uh, It's more like a claw grip. You know, it's not like super flat and it's not, it's not like, like, you know, the Paul Macbeth, it looks like I'm probably accidentally flipping you off, but it's more like a, it, I'm curled like this almost. And that's what feels comfortable to me. Um, and it's really about getting, I don't know which, which finger is it. I think it's this finger on the flight plate is like right here. That's what's comfortable for me. And then another thing that I was, uh, I start, so that's a, a here's a better answer for you. Um, so, just in the last couple of months, I started being able to have control on distance drivers that I haven't had the same control. I could throw a distance driver 400 feet, um, but it would go nowhere close to what I wanted. And so there was no reason for me to ever throw a distance driver in a, in a round because it just, I had zero control. I had the power, but I didn't understand the dome always bothered me in the beginning on the distance drivers. Um, a lot of them are very domey. Um, and so I started with a um, with approach discs for hands, justices, zones, things that were really overstable that would have a little bit uh, of extra torque correction. So my main upshot disc is a justice because um, I can hammer into it and it's going to stay pretty straight the whole time. Um, and I like that. I like the re- reliability of that. The zone, I don't have to throw as hard and I can I guess almost hyzer flip it. Um, but I started with just approach tests for the longest time. And then finally I moved into fairways and fairways were really hard because I was like different, different type of disc, different speed. I was having nose issues. And so for the longest time, I'd say for a full year, I was just doing, uh, well, probably last six months. Sorry. I'd say the beginning of the year, my forehand started coming up from just approach this to, 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 um, being able to park stuff very regularly with my forehand and for first I just had one line and then now I can throw big hyzers on the forehand I can flow and I just learned I'd say a couple months ago flex forehands that uh, I'm now being able to have a lot of angle control on it um 
and it all just it's a, it, it all comes through um, a um, it you, you don't learn one thing overnight you know it's a it's a natural progression that people need to understand so you're not going to be able to throw 350 360 feet forehands in the beginning but you can throw a hundred foot upshot that you can get really good at with good control and then build out from there. Obviously angle control is super important and I'm glad you mentioned it. What are some things that you did maybe in the field or on the course that helped you work on angle control? Cause I feel like, you know, everyone can have that raw power, that raw strength, but if you don't have that angle control, it's really hard to control where your disc is going to go. Uh, I found really good forehand, uh, local forehand players um, that can crush a forehand. They're dominant forehand players. We know a lot of those guys that are dominant forehand players, but when they have it, dude, it's, it's, it's amazing that they can throw it 400 feet and land where they want to land it. And so, you know, I, one thing that's really hel uh, helped me is like, it could be a brand new guy or a really good expert. I'm open to playing with anyone and I learned something from everyone. And so there's one thing that I noticed with, um, with my forehand is I didn't have enough thumb pressure. And so the disc would wobble a lot when it came out of my hand. And there was one local pro named Tanner Kennedy. Not, well, he's an advanced pro player, but um, that helped me realize that my thumb pressure, especially on my distance drivers, was not, I was not as comfortable with them. And so that really allowed me to have a lot more control on the angle of the disc. And just like on your backhand, where like when we deal with like degrees, Anheuser, Heiser, it's not like this or this, you know, depending on what you're doing, it can be, but um, there's subtle degrees on your forehand. And so it takes a long time to understand the subtleties of, that, of what that flight's going to do with the stability of that disc. And so that's called, you know, that's the, that's the type of um, angle management I'm talking about that you have to develop even on your forehand. So in the beginning, the, I think the reason they say two things, they say, hey, go under stable and just learn how to hyzer flip, you know, something really understand like sidewinder or heat or something like that. And really just snap your wrist up. You're going to get a lot of distance because it's so glidey. There's, that's one way to learn beforehand. But another way is to really use something extremely overstable and just really learn how to hammer on it and because it'll correct itself. You know, you can't flip that one over. So it just depends on what you want to learn. But I'd say those, like something overstable, like a Pioneer or a, um, or a, a Firebird or, you know, something that, that, that is just going to be really hard to turn over or a hyzer flip where you can get a lot of distance. But learning both is really good because if you have a hyzer flip forehand in the woods, woo, look out. Yeah, that's, that's really good, you know, because I've been working on that uh, here myself on my forehand. And I was having a hard time, you know, with the timing and just kind of rolling everything over, rolling my wrist over. And, you know, I went back to the same stuff that helped me kind of get my backhand down. And I've literally just only been throwing forehands from a standstill. Because um, I, I was trying to focus on that footwork and everything in my timing, you know, the pendulum, everything. It was too much. So, I yeah. said, you know, just going to a standstill learning on bringing that arm through, focusing on timing and focusing on the wrist. And that has helped me out a ton. You know, and once I feel comfortable with that motion, because burning, you know, getting that muscle memory, you know, you're going to tear some muscle there for a bit. Once I'm comfortable with that, I think then I will move on to that X step and start moving into that slowly. Dude, you just highlighted something really important, like super important is, um, when we're learning something new from what I've, what I know within myself and, and other people that, that I've established working with at the clinics is, is that you can only focus on one thing. And if you're bringing too, too many elements and, and I've read a lot of books on not sports psychology, yes, but, um, uh, learning. And, uh, one big thing is chunking. So you learn one thing. And so now you have that down where you consciously like whatever rewires your gray matter in the brain, whatever it is, the neural networks, but you don't have to think about the angle control as much anymore. So then once you establish the basic forehand principle from the standstill, you can then incorporate the extra um, uh, strength from your lower body back leg. And like you said, it's, 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 it's doing one thing first and chunking it together, bringing the pieces together. That's the best way to learn. So what you hit there is starting from a standstill, absolutely. 
doing anything more than that. Actually, I start a lot of people from a need because I don't want them to use their body. I just want them to use, see how much, how much a disc can go with just a flick of the wrist. You know, you can flick a disc 200 feet. I think anyone can with a flick of the wrist. Uh, so you don't need a lot of body to, to get that distance. You know what I mean? So I want to teach people that there's a lot of just power, you know, anyone can do this. And, and I think that's the best way to learn. It's just learning how to do that. This feels really weird when you begin. It's like, man, this is inverting my wrist. Um, but eventually, you, you know, just, just that right there is just so much power that, and that's one thing I did is I was throwing way too hard on my forehand, way too hard. I don't know if everyone has that problem. That was a big problem for me. So I was just, I was going 117% into those forehands and it was not working. Yeah, I definitely feel that the last couple of weeks, like I had mentioned earlier, you know, we're improving the forehand. I feel like the less hard I throw, the better the shot actually is. And then uh, we were playing doubles at Oak on Wednesday and we were playing the short on 18, the short uh, tee to the short basket. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I literally said, all right, guy just pull out this nice little Zeus and, you know, we're just going to power down and it's going to hit the rocks and fall next to the basket. The next thing I knew I was 60 feet past the basket <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay, I guess this is a problem all of a sudden. <laughs> um, but like that is a good problem to have and like the slow starts. And I think just an overarching theme of this episode is also don't care what other people think about your own disc golf game, right? Because oh. someone out on the course, will see, let's say myself or Horatio or whomever, Maybe you, the listener, will be, you know, throwing standstill, trying to get better. And maybe it's not going that well. Who cares what that other person thinks? Because you're constantly improving. And it goes back to what you said earlier about the if you don't suck, you cannot get better. So I really love that shout out about the standing still and really focusing in on what you're doing. Um, anything else, I guess, that you have to add on that topic before we move yeah, on? Yeah, no, that's great because um... – I actually started the backhand from the standstill and I was way better. I had uh, way more control. Um, and I took a uh, fifth place at Colwich uh, a few months after starting in MA2. And I played that whole entire tournament from a standstill backhand. Wow. Um, and so like imagine a 245 pound six, three plus guy just doing his standstill thing. I'm sure it looked dorky and dumb. And that's the thing. It's like, we can make so many reasons why not to try something. You know, people don't break out the forehand because it's like, Oh dude, I got throw in front of these people. Yeah, you do. You do. And so there, um, I just, for some reason, I've always been brazen to like, just not care, you know, cause I know I'm not thinking about what I look like today. I'm thinking about what I can, what I can look like tomorrow. And that's always uh, made me feel comfortable with just having that, great ability to just be really, 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 really bad for a really, 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 really long time. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's really good. You know, and I think if you don't feel dorky or dumb when you're learning and practicing, I don't think you're doing it correctly because we hear a lot about of having to like exaggerate those movements because you feel in your head, like you're changing something in your form, but then you go, go back and watch the video and you're, you're not doing it at all. Wow. It's like, Dude, it, it, that's in your amazing. Head, so, so if you're not exaggerating it to where you dumb or dorky, I don't think that you're acting correctly, if that makes sense. Yeah. There, the, I use a word over-exaggerate a lot because when I do those clinics, it's funny. People come in and I'm like, well, let's work on this and let's just really over-exaggerate the movement and then because I want them to not do what they were doing. And then they'll just do exactly what they did showing up. They can't break it. And so I'm like, okay, so instead of trying to do this, let's really, really over-exaggerate the movement. And I'm like, so you're throwing, you're releasing way early. So I want you to release to your right about 45 degrees. So like pretty much grip lock, like do that. And until you start actually throwing over there, then we can bring it back. But otherwise you're just taking this really early release. And I'm trying to show them how they can get a lot more um, power by throwing across their body it's not really throwing across your body but in this example it's it's allowing them to line up their body better because all they're doing is just kind of just rounding and it's not working so i'm just trying to get them on a different angle and so um over exaggeration is key because then you can always bring it back so like you said you record yourself and you're like man i thought i was like 
way over the mark. And then you record yourself and you're doing it really well. But you thought you're way, way beyond what you're supposed to do. And so that's how like the mind works for some reason that I've learned as well, is that you really need to over exaggerate. And then if once you see yourself like, let's say, man, I'm releasing early, well, then release, you know, way right. And until you do that, then you can start bringing back because now you feel that in your body of how it feels. Now you have something to, to assess it on on how you used to do it versus this over exaggeration mode and you can find some happy middle ground. You know what I mean? So I love that word. That's a really great word. Yeah, that was awesome. So I guess talking about your clinics, are they still going on? What are they for, you know, the folk here locally in Wichita or, you know, maybe you're at home listening to this right now and you're like, ah, yeah, I'd like to do a clinic. I I, I'm good enough. I can do that. Like what, what, what does your clinic look like? When does it happen? Those kinds of things, I guess, plug your clinic. Dude, no, no, that, that's the thing is like anyone who has a passion for disc golf can do a clinic. So when I first began it, we have a local group of about, I think, a little less than 3,000 people in the Wichita area, a local Facebook group. And, you know, I just said, hey, field work is fun. You know, you learn a lot, but it's a lot more fun with friends. So I'm going to be doing field work at this time. If anybody wants to come show, show up, let's work on our weaknesses together, you know. And then if for some reason – I can help you in any way. Um, I'd be happy to um, drop you maybe a tip or two on, on your form or technique or whatever. Mind you, please take everything I say with an absolute grain of salt because I do not know anything. So we, I think the first one I had like five or six people show up and I was like, this is weird. And so anyway, um, I never called them clinics because I never felt comfortable with that because I don't want to sound like I'm an expert, right? But then everyone else started calling in clinics, you know, and like, hey, I want to make one of your clinics. I'm like, that's just really just a field day with us getting together and having, having fun. Yeah. So that evolved from um, that to, to just bring uh, this calling them clinics and, and people sh- um, actually coming out to work with me to work on their, their weaknesses or to learn a skill set. And like I said, it's like, I don't know everything. So I teach the very fundamentals, but as long as you have a passion for disc golf, you know, just, you don't need to be an expert. You, Horatio, anyone, you could teach, you could teach something to anyone, you know, you don't need to be some expert. I'm no expert. You know, I haven't been playing this game for 10 years and I have some degree of mastery yet. You you don't need that. And so that's why I think it stops a lot of people from wanting to um, be more involved. It's just feeling like they have to be some, perfect individual and, and, and having the perfect form. I, I think you've seen me throw, I don't have the perfect form, um, but every day I get closer, you know what I mean? And, you know, I think some, at some point it almost hurts, hurts players if uh, the ones teaching the clinics or whatever are pros. Like if you had someone like Simon Lazar or Eagle teaching a clinic, let's say for like novice players, new player, these guys have been playing for so long that some of the stuff that the new players are struggling with isn't even in their head. Like that hasn't been an issue for 10 years. A lot of the stuff they're not going to be able to relate to those new players. I'm like, th- like I get why you're having an issue, but I, it's harder for them to help them because they've been throwing 500 feet easy for the last five years or, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of those issues they can't relate to. So yeah. players that are newer, you know, they're newer lower level pl- pros or ams or just anybody, they're going to be able to relate because they had that issue a year ago, six months ago. And mm-hmm. they'll remember what they were able to fix or change to get yeah. rid of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 100%. And that's why, um, you know, there's a lot of like, there would be guys coming out that I said, hey, um, this is not just about me. This is about sharing collective insights. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, you know, a lot of people, they don't get together and like help each other. It's just like, hey, let's go shoot around. And I get it. You know, it's fun. And that's what you're supposed to do. But I've learned more than I've given at those clinics because everyone is sharing their own. Um, We we had uh, Justin Aiken come out, uh, who's a a local guy who has a sick forehand, so smooth, throws so far and effortless, and he's not the biggest guy, you know. And he's one of the first people that really started working with me with my forehand um, and just giving me tips, you know. And, And I remember just thinking about it now. I'm like, dude, I had no idea what I was doing, but at least I tried, you know. Now it's like, man, I was not doing, I was doing some dumb stuff, but you know, in hindsight, but um, it's just, you know, so I do those clinics whenever I can Um, during the season. It's usually like try to do it once a month. 
and I just post on the Facebook group when I don't have a tournament that weekend and just say, Hey, we're doing it this time. And they're obviously completely free. I don't think I'm ever going to charge for teaching disc golf and so a passion, something that I love. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. That's really cool. Definitely uh, would love to show up to one of those the next time you do it. Um, like, I guess, Good how brother. has the turnout like changed? Cause you know, you said you were starting at, you know, five or six folk, like have, have you seen like a pretty like a massive increase, I guess, in turnout or like what, it, what, what is the average turnout for one of these? I'd say the average turnout is a handful. Yeah. yeah. Five, five, five to seven people. Um, a lot of people are always new. We have, um, a few repeats, you know, uh, there's one guy that I, I think he's missed one clinic. I mean, he's, he's so like, you know, he's always there and you love to see it. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I, I think I've been doing it for the last six months or so. Um, and you know, we've may maybe have had 30, 40 different people show up, which to me is pretty crazy. It yeah. may not sound like a lot of people, but to me, having one person show up <laughs> wanting to learn anything uh, with me about disc golf is, is quite the miracle. <laughs> yeah, pe people want to learn better. You know, I think that's, that's awesome. And it's better to teach those people that actually want to get better. It's mm -hmm. easier to teach them. So, you know, that's why it's like that volunteer kind of thing. See who shows up. They're, they're waste, not wasting, but, you know, it's their time. It's your time. And it's going to be easier for them to learn for sure. But mm -hmm. I want to move a little bit, you know, before we get into the H round questions, just real quick, touch on kind of your future goals, kind of where you're at right now, where you want to go. Um, Cause you know, we've seen some newer players pop up on the, you know, on the pro tour have, that have not been playing that long. Is that kind of a goal for you or where are you wanting to go into with disc golf right now? Um, yeah. Um, wow. You know, I mean, of course, like I would, I would love to be an elite disc golfer. Um, I just don't know how long that really takes. You know what I mean? I've been at it a, a, for a year. I'm 35. I'm a little bit older than Brody. He had some, uh, he had some ultimate background. So, you know, he's got, a, I'd say extra couple years of great experience underneath his belt. So I don't know how long, you know, how long it's going to take. Um, but next year, you know, I'd like to see myself um, get out there instead of just competing in local tournaments as a pro to get out there and compete with the best because that's the next level for me to just get shot on and, and learn a, a great deal. You know, so that's my next year is, is to really start hitting some of those pro tour events, Not, you know, maybe a half dozen or so. Hopefully by that time, you know, I do find some type of sponsorship that would allow me the opportunity, you know, to, to just make that a little bit easier, but, um, and just learning a lot, you know, um, and, and, and I guess I'm open to everything, but just not attached to anything that like, I, I have some, you know, great ambitions, but, and they're lofty, but really it's just about really enjoying the process and really devoting myself to, to this i believe in life like society really sets us up for like needing to have this this and this to feel successful and i feel like it doesn't matter what you do in your life it really matters that you have a passion and you devote everything to it um and so for me at 35 um like i don't i don't this golf fits in my lane, you know, it, it's, 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 it's exactly what I'm, I'm looking for to compete at an older age as an elite athlete um, to not need a lot of things to be happy because when you do the tour life until you start really winning, it's pretty rough out there. You know what I mean? You're going to have to get used to just not having a lot. Um, and so, but all those things fit in because like to travel around and just have a passion to experience new things uh, new places and have a, have a, uh, you know, be able to grow in a sport into my forties. Um, that's just, it's really exactly what I'm looking for. Um, will that ever manifest? Will I ever get that good? Who knows, you know, but, um, Logan Harpool is a good, uh, good, um, inspiration, you know, um, seeing how great he's gotten in four years and competing with the best in the world and having the ball, the balls to go compete in worlds and, and, um, you know, just finishing, um, I think it was a 67th, which yeah. to me, like, 
I would dream of finishing 67th at Worlds, you know? And so, yeah, it's not first, yeah, it's not 10th, but dude, I mean, to get out there and do that, you know, so, so, you know, Logan's a good friend of mine. And so like to, to have people around you that, that can compete at those levels. And then you're like, it just gives you a little bit more like, well, maybe this isn't some impossibility. Maybe it can be a probability if you put in the work and you really devote yourself completely, you know? Yeah, that was an awesome answer. And I'm going to ask you to be real vulnerable with us here for if you don't mind. Could you take me a little bit through like when you first got into the sport, let's say a month into it, what were you throwing at compared to what you're throwing at now? Or like, you know, maybe, you know, what was your consistency like with putting? Like just a real quick snapshot. Take me what that first month was like and how it compares to now. Um, well, for some reason, I was like, I, I got to get my hands dirty. So I just started jumping in tournaments like the first month I started playing. Um, and um, it was not good. I think I shot like plus 19 in El Dorado you know, and like was last place, um, or something like that. Um, I, um, I, I didn't really have a good forehand, so I wasn't forehanding. Um, I would throw a lot of nose up, you know, um, and just zero consistency in anything and up shots off the tee putting, you know, nerves were nerve wracking for me in tournaments. I didn't know how to control my nerves which is really weird for me because I like to think that I'm can, but it just took me really a full year to get over the nerves of playing in tournaments. I think I played in more tournaments last year than my brother Lucas did in seven years. You know what I mean? And I think, I think, you know, that was a, the best thing I could have done uh, is just now, you know, when I go into tournament, I'm really not that nervous. Even when I'm playing against the pro level, which I, I feel like I'm always playing up, you know, um, that I'm not really nervous anymore in that regard. But I will say that, you know, uh, and I don't mean to segue in this, is one thing that I think I, I, I want to say, because I know I'll forget, is that, so at DDO, um, I made the lead card um, in, at, at Advanced, um, which was for me, was like, I was already playing up. I was like an intermediate player. And I was like, no, I'm going to move up. And then from that experience, I'm like, I'm going to move up locally in the pro tournaments. And one thing that happened is when I got on that lead card um, the second day, these guys were a lot better than me in a lot of ways. And I got, instead of sticking to my own game and my own strengths and be like, just play this for a three. It's going to be hard to birdie this. Just play it for a three. I would try to go too big because it's like, these guys are getting close. They're getting looks. And I, I would, I would throw OB because I still didn't have the angle control with my power to, to manage the flight. And so, so don't get baited in like people better than you getting baited into like getting out of your own game. So that's one thing I want to say, but I, I, I was just, you can look at all my, all my tournament history. I was not placing good. I was the bottom third of intermediate for the longest time. And then I started moving up a little bit to the top half. And then from there I started finishing a lot of top fives, you know, or top threes and, and being really consistent and finishing high at that level. And, and then, you know, just uh, this year, I was like, yeah, I'm just moving up to advanced. And, you know, I placed, you know, a few bad spots, a few good spots. And I'm like, what's the difference? You know, there's some good talent here, but these guys have been playing advanced for like two, three years. They're not going to get any better. They're not pushing themselves. So I'm like, I'm going to move up. I'm going to push myself. I'm going to get, I'm going to finish last place in pro. That's okay. But at least I'm going to get some good experience, get, get those nerves underneath my belt. So when I do play against better players, really better players, I'm not going to get baited again. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Stick to my strengths, you know? Yeah, that's so good. You know, playing with people that are better than you. Definitely. I remember that one time, I think you and Tanner and somebody else were practicing for a tournament and I, I saw you guys up there and I just jumped in to play around with you guys. Yeah. And it just helps so much playing with people that are better than you because you see different lines. You see how a hole should be played, how it could be played. And also you see less mistakes. I feel yeah. like when you play with people that are not as, that are not as good as you or they're at your level, you see so many more mistakes. So it becomes normal. You see people messing <laughs> up. So it's normal. You know, it's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. You play up, you play with people that are better than you're like, they're not making those mistakes. You know, this is how they didn't make that mistake or they're, this is how they're avoiding that mistake. 
Yep. Yep. So true. Um, in fact, um, uh, recent, well, I mean, this is just one example recently, um, Smitty and I, one of the best, uh, pro players in the state, um, hugely consistent, uh, went to go play a C tier. Uh, we drove together and, uh, I think he shot a 1070 round or something, just shot lights out. And, um, I ended up taking second place in that, uh, in that tournament, um, in MPO, but there wasn't a huge feel, but my point is, is like just playing with someone like Smitty, I just pretty much followed his lines. Like that, that's, he's got that experience. I followed his lines and I shot pretty well. I didn't do anything crazy, but like, so my, my, my point is, is like when I play up, I see these guys lines um, and I just kind of replicate it for the most part. Like I don't get baited. I just replicate what I know I can throw and it leads to a lot more consistency. So I think decision-making uh, like you said, like, you know, you kind of play at that level of, um, of your card almost, you know, it's kind of like when Ricky and, and Calvin and, you know, um, Paul and all those guys, they, they really push each other and they play up almost because they're all kind of playing at that elite level. Um, so I, th I think there's a lot of truth in what you said. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. And I mean, Horatio and I have even decided ourselves that, you know, we cannot get better by continuing to play in the rec division and we need to push ourselves. And in order to do that, we're just going to completely make the jump to advanced. And who cares oh! <laughs> if we get last, but like at least we're playing up to a point where you're going to learn something and you might walk away getting last, but you're going to walk away as a better disc golfer than you will by beating everyone in the rec division by 10 strokes like you cannot get better by doing that um so Brother. that's something just we've personally decided to yeah. do yeah yeah and hopefully it works out maybe we won't get yeah. last maybe we will get last but the point is if you want to get better you have to have that mindset uh, and i'm just really glad you said it as well i know we've been going for a long time i'm gonna ask you one more question before we get into the ace round if you could for me maybe sum up you know just kind of what this podcast has been so far could you sum up maybe what your top three tips are for moving up and getting better like you know how you've improved so much in a year what are your three tips for improvement yeah i guess number one is uh you you get back um from how much time you put into anything and um you know i think we've covered that a great deal um but you can't suck you can't always suck you're eventually going to get better and to really have that perseverance that if you want anything to persevere through that process to be willing to be a beginner uh, there's there's a there's a quote that like something along the road to mastery begins with being a beginner and having the fortitude to to, to get through that process. Um, so that's step number one. Step number two, play up. A lot of people, you know, are sandbaggers because they're in their comfort zones. But you want to surround yourself with people much better than you. And that's how I became a really good basketball player because. Now, Lucas is only three years older. It doesn't sound like that when we're in our third, that big of a deal when we're in our thirties, but in grade school, junior high, high school, when I played against Lucas's friends in basketball, dude, they would rough me up, but it made me a hell of a better athlete. And, you know, I went on to become like a first team all state basketball player. And I, I, I'd say a lot of it was because I was played against people way better than me. Um, so playing up, you learn so much more. It's one step backwards for two giant steps forward. And that's how I feel. Get out of your comfort zone. Number three, work, I guess work on your weaknesses. Um, it sounds pretty basic as well, but if you have a sexy backhand or a sexy forehand, um, or you're just an average putter, you know, you're, you're consistent but not consistent, Work on your weaknesses. Really make that, uh, the, the, you know, there's theories that work on your strengths, work on this, work on everything, yes, but really bring up your game uh, to an even playing field. Up shots, uh, off the tee, putts. Um, if you've never worked on an Anheuser release, work on Anheuser releases. If, you, if you're not good with mid-ranges, get that into your game, um, et cetera. 
Cool. You know, I think that's perfect. And that's stuff that people can put to action immediately. I especially love that last answer it has nothing to do with finances, but it kind of reminded me of like the whole Dave Ramsey or like how to, you know, how to be debt free. And he talks about his like snowball effect. And it's like, take on the small, like the littlest one, knock that one out and then go to the next one and the next one oh, yeah. and the next one, yeah. the bigger one. And I feel like you can apply to that to, you know, your final answer, your weaknesses start with like, you know, your easiest weakness or whatever you can improve and then go to the next one. That's going to be the more challenging and more. And eventually like you'll be more of a solid player than you were before. Yeah. And when you're doing field work, always start with your weaknesses because that's going to take the most mental energy. Do that for the first 20, 30 minutes. And then from there, go have fun, go through your bombs or whatever you knock your socks off, you know, uh, reward yourself for working on your weaknesses and get through that mental, that mental uh, barrier. Cool. Well, with that, you know, ton of, ton of info here, so much for people to learn. Um, but I think we're ready for the ACE round if you guys are. Yeah, for sure. Before we get into it, Horatio, just go ahead and give those new listeners what the heck is the ACE round? What are we about to get into? And if you've enjoyed what we've been talking about so far and you're ready to go hit the course and get better, if you're watching on YouTube, if you could leave us a like, if you could follow Cody on Instagram, he's got significantly more Instagram followers than we do. So you might already be following him, but if you're not, make sure you do that. Uh, leave us a rating or review, maybe send a, a DM of what you took away from this episode. That would be fantastic. But Horatio, go ahead and uh, sum uh, summarize the ACE round for us. Yeah, so these are just five questions that we ask to every single person we have on. Some of them are educational, and that way, you know, people can compare the answers to every other uh, guest we have on. And then some are just kind of, you know, for uh, creative, you know, kind of see what the players are into, what their likes are. But the first question is, you're taking a buddy, you know, or someone that just came to your clinic, Cody, a new player. What one putter, mid, and driver would you recommend them getting? One putter, mid, or driver. Um, I think grabbing um, a driver that is um, understable would give them a lot more confidence uh, because, you know, we really want a lot of distance. And you can just throw those um, for people's arm speed. So say something like a heat or a sidewinder or something like that. I don't know if those are distance drivers and do like nines, nine speeds, maybe, um, um, maybe a Hades or, um, something super flippy like that, that can build a lot of confidence and would work for, um, the level of power you need. Um, and because that will build a lot of confidence, um, a mid, there's a lot of great mids. I throw the buzz. Um, I know a lot of people would throw the rock, um, I'm a buzz thrower. So, um, I put with links, um, but just something that you're comfortable with. I mean, everything's a personal preference when it comes to a putter it, for me, they all, they have a little under and a little over, you know, but, um, I, you find something that's really comfortable in the hand. It took me the longest time to find a comfortable putter in my hand. So really experiment. If you have a friends who have putters, grab, you know, a handful and just get out there. Um, and just experiment with what feels good in your hand, I think is the, the biggest uh, advice I can give. Yeah, for, for sure. Especially because a lot of putters seem to fly the same way. It's just more of, hey, does this actually feel comfortable in your hand? And I have been a long time Westside Crown user and recently switched just because I finally have found something else that fits better in my hand. And I've got more confidence than ever in my putt. So never be afraid to experiment. Never be afraid to continue to elevate your game. So what did you switch to? I, I switched to a PA3 by Oh, nice. Prodigy. Love the PA3. Um, oh, yeah. I saw like 20 of them at our local Play It Again Sports, and I said, you know what? This blue one looks fun. Feels pretty good. I'm going to get it. If it's good, I'll come back and I'll pick some more up. Every Love single it. time that I've gone back, there's no PA3s there. <laughs> so I am a guy in need of more PA3s. So I got a couple knows, for you if you're really looking, brother. Yeah. If anyone knows <laughs> someone with a PA3, I am open to conversation at this point. Because <laughs> I am ready to fully convert to the PA3 lifestyle. Loving it. Uh, yeah. Very, very big fan of that. But our second question we got for you is, what is your favorite course you have played and one course you would love to play in the future? Um, wow. Um, of course, playing that, uh, world's course, 
and the James Conrad shot heard around the world uh, comes to the first course in mind to want to play because I want to see how hard that shot was, like be on the course, awesome. you know. And yeah, and just see how hard those courses are. I know those pros made it look so easy. I know I'm going to shoot a plus 77 there, but, but <laughs> you know, that would be a lot of fun just to kind of experience what they experienced and went through. Um, favorite courses. Gosh, there's so many really good courses. Um, maybe uh, I just want to kind of, maybe it's bland, but I kind of get, I guess want to pick Emporia Country Club because I shot it so well. And um and uh, it's just uh, a bigger ball golf course, which I think uh, fits a little bit more of my play style. Um, and uh, I have good memories there. So that's the first course that comes to mind that, that just I'd love to go shoot any time. Oh, perfect. All right, next question. One tip you would give to yourself when you just started playing? Just be patient with the process, um, especially when I, when I started competing early on. I would be so – upset that i botched a shot and like of course you're gonna botch shots dude you're completely brand new so just having patience with yourself and like really calibrating just feeling good and and making that your priority in your tournament rounds uh because um i think i was lackluster in that for a long time getting yeah, I think that's a really serious good. getting too serious about the moment yeah yeah no for sure that's definitely i feel like that's really hard to like separate yourself from just because you want to go in you want to win you want to do so good and it's like ah, you got to trust the process the philadelphia 76ers were bad for a long time but uh you know the phoenix suns were bad for a long time and they might win an nba championship this year so there you go baby. that's the better analogy <laughs> uh the third question we got for you is, or i guess the fourth question is what is your favorite memory playing disc golf Oh, they're still building. Um, one of the things that really got me into disc golf uh, fully was like Lucas and Kendra, my brother and sister-in-law, doing all these fun weekend trips, going out of town, going out of state, grabbing a hotel room together with them and playing a lot of golf together with your family. Dude, I couldn't ask for like a more fun we all have such a passion, you know, 11 out of uh, uh, one through 10. That's how much we love disc golf, you know? So to be able to, to ha do something with the people you absolutely love that and love it as much as you it's, it's epic. Yeah. I swear sometimes I have some of those, like not necessarily epiphany, but like Zen moments out on the course, like when you're walking with buddies or someone, like the weather's just super nice. You're having a good round. The sun is like starting to set and like it just feels so good like at that moment that's 100 bro 100 all right last question we got for you here is what is the biggest mistake you see new players make um well two things one, one is uh not putting enough time in if they're serious about it um finding even if it's 20 minutes a day to put into like your your craft um, and, and not doing enough off the course work, you know what I mean? Just getting in there and like, Hey, let's go shoot around with a buddy. And that's all they do. And always keeping score on your, on your, on your rounds with your buddies. It's fun, but there's a lot of times like Nolan Rams are, because you know, he's only a 17 year old kid, right? I think he was 16 at the time, but the guy's obviously really good. And to be closed minded that you can't learn from a kid is really, is really just, ego tripping you know I, I i i you know nolan is by far one of the best players i've ever known and he's only 17 and so i know there's a lot i could pick up from him so i asked him what can i do what made you would you say could make you better uh quicker or helped you improve more dramatically and he goes take the same mold say as an explorer or a buzz or whatever take that same mold take five of them and shoot the same shot five times and get it within circle one. So I took that advice and that, so I would rather do that with a friend. I do it by myself, but it, I'd rather not keep score and do that with a friend and, and get the, and, and build up that consistency with that mold, really understand that mold and show that four out of five times I'm getting circle one on this shot. And that builds so much more confidence and just competing 
short term and getting the, you know, the dopamine hit when you beat someone or you, you know, you get a birdie or whatever, you know what I mean? So I, I think that that's the biggest number one thing that, that I picked up on better performance is, is, is doing something like that in more field work off the course. That is an awesome answer. Cody, this was a fantastic <laughs> episode. I had a ton of fun. I know it was a little bit longer, but by golly, I've got a full sheet of notes uh, that I cannot wait to go take out with me the next time I'm out on the course. Where can the people interact with you on social media before we get out of here? Instagram is probably the best place. Big kid at heart underscore. That's where I'm at. Feel free to uh, DM me. It could be about disc golf. It could be about anything. I love helping people. So if you got anything going on in your life and you just need someone to talk to, just hit me up with a DM. Happy to just be there and kick it and get to know you. Cool. Yeah, Perfect. and if you well, get on this guy's Instagram, Horatio, I'm going to let you ask this question, but I wanted to set, I want to, I want to put it up on the tee for you. If you get on this guy's Instagram, you might have a thought. Horatio, what, what is that thought? Ask the question that everyone's going to be thinking. Uh. So, would you say who's uh, more yoked, you or Ezra Adderhold? <laughs> I've never met Ezra in person, but he might be leaner than me. He looks yeah. pretty mighty lean. Yeah, I got a little extra fluff pounds these days, but uh, but yeah, I think it's going to be a close battle. But uh, who can throw farther, Ezra? <laughs> for now, <laughs> for now. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Cody. Thank you for your time. It was a really you know, really good talk. And I'm sure we'll see you out on the course. You know, you're one of those people that when I start, I think we started playing about the same time, but I would see you out there constantly at Oak, you know, and I'm like one of those like regular to Oaks just since I live close by, but I'm sure we'll see you and maybe we'll get a round in here soon. Anytime brother. And I really appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to talk about this golf, talk about a passion and being so new to this sport. It really meant a lot for you guys to reach out. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for listening to the Chain Clankers podcast. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chain Clankers and hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to us from so you never miss another episode.